Okay, well, um, this is a talk about Peekaboo, uh, our open source capture agent dashboard, uh, written by myself and my colleague, Paul Gratian. Um, we work at the University of Sussex, I do for the next few weeks anyway. <coughs> and then I will be moving on. Oops, I can't move on to the next slide. There we go. So, <coughs> why did we build Peekaboo? Our support team um, and ourselves um, need to be able to provide remote support uh, for all of our various capture agents. We've got about 50 in place at the moment. <coughs> uh, we'll be expanding another 15 or 20 over the uh, next couple of months. Um <coughs> and we wanted to be able to see what was going on on all of our various boxes. Also, we wanted to experiment with some real-time web development and um, this seemed as good an excuse as any to do that. So, hopefully we can get back out of here again and get to the demo. <coughs> so, we have various different methods of authentication implemented at the moment. Um, I'm using LDAP here. Remember my password. Uh, so we've got LDAP. Um, Andy from Manchester added CAS support. Um, and there's also an internal um, uh, user system as well. <coughs> and we can do a little bit of user management. Uh, so we can assign roles and uh, change passwords and things. There's a few different roles. There's a viewer who can only see things but can't actually do any remote control. There's control who can do the control as well. And there's admin who can get to places like this as well. So <coughs> this is the main screen. You might have seen the screenshot earlier from um, Stuart uh, with his far more impressive list of 300-odd uh, capture agents. This is a demo system, so hence why everything is offline, apart from one. <coughs> uh, but um, we can see uh, screenshots from the desktop of each galley caster. These are all galley caster machines. We can change that to presentation, um, so that's all the computer inputs or camera and, and then we can also just uh, do some zooming in and out so we can see more or less at the same time. <coughs> There's also show volume meter which is going to be really boring as well because there's no sound going on on any of the devices, especially if they're not online, uh, but does live updates of uh, the average peak volumes um, so that we can see if there are rooms that don't have anything um, in them. We've also got a bunch of filters up here, so um, this shows all the ones that are offline, so there's 14 offline at the moment. If you click on it, I want to see all the offline ones. Uh, this is if the um, audio is below a certain threshold, so we can find ones that are not running. Uh, then there's um, recording and paused. We added the pause in because people, uh, all of our recordings are manually started uh, and sometimes people hit pause rather than stop and they just leave, um, lots of them end up in the pause state. So it's nice to be able to go and find those. We can also um, do sort of real time um, uh, searching. Uh, so you can narrow down what you're looking at. Uh, then you can go into a room itself. <coughs> so we have a larger picture, which again you can switch between presentation camera and the Gallicaster full screen. Uh, this is the uh, inputs that are available uh, on this particular machine. It's IP address, so we can copy and paste into other tools if we have to go into. Um, VNC or something, uh, and this is a um, 
link into one of our internal systems that registers the network devices so we can uh, easily uh, modify stuff like that. And then we've got these two panels here, which uh, this one is a live audio, um, which you won't let me do because I have, have it locked off. Uh, so again, this is not going to look very impressive, but <coughs> if you were looking at the... Um, mixer on the machine itself, you'd see that they're actually moving at the same time. Um, and it also works bi-directionally, so if you change the audio levels on the device, um, the faders on the web move as well, which is to say, it's very impressive if you see it like that, but it's not there. Um, this is an audio preview, which again is not going to work because uh, that's behind the firewall, um, but um, that will give us uh, way of listening to the audio, monitoring it, and then setting the levels using the faders. Uh, the red is for recording and the blue is for playback, so that if uh, a support person is actually in the room uh, and they want to plug some headphones in the front of the device, they can fiddle with the playback audio level as well. Um, and this would uh, be moving up and down, uh, should there actually be any audio there. Uh, over here we've got um, some... Oops. The right button. We can start uh, manual recording. Um, so, oops, missed. We can choose which sources to record. And um, let's be me. So, this looks up into our um, university systems. If I was a lecturer and I had courses that I taught on, um, it would bring up a list of courses that I had available, which would be the series ID, um, and also it would bring up a photo, so you know you're you. We use this to start recordings off for other people who are incapable of pressing the start button themselves, so we can remotely start things off. <coughs> so we hit start recording, you notice the record indicator um, popped up immediately, uh, and the screen updated. Uh, we update the... Um, screen images every 10 seconds, unless something important happens, in which case we push an update immediately, so that they, it looks like something's happened when the recording starts. Um, and also we can do things like press pause, and see the pause immediately appears, and, and a new screenshot is grabbed. Um, so if we go back here, you see that the pause and record will appear up on that list, and they will appear in these filters now as well, so we can look for just the recording ones and see it. We'll just pause ones and see that too. So we also get a, a information about the recording itself. Um, the duration will go to a nice time once it's long enough. Um, so then we can stop the recording, go back to the normal state, get our new screenshot. And then that recording will be winging its way into OpenCast. So I think that's pretty much it for the demo. Oops. Oops. Okay. Oops, don't need that. <coughs> so the technology that's involved um, on the web app side, uh, we're using a Frameworkish thing called Meteor, uh, which is full stack JavaScript. It's actually written in CoffeeScript, um, all our code, um, most of our code is written in CoffeeScript. Um, it has two way data bindings um, with uh, reactive templating, which is how we handle the um, everything updating seamlessly. Uh, we've got LDAP um, or Active Directory actually support and CAS support. On the database side, um, there's a Mongo database um, running behind this. Uh, and Meteor allows us to run real-time reactive database queries. Um, so basically we can subscribe to a uh, query on the database and Meteor notifies all of the clients who are connected to it who want to uh, know about that particular database, what's going on over WebSockets. So the uh, client connects in, either the web app or the uh, capture agent connects into the core um, and the 
core web app notifies um, anything that's subscribed to that particular room um, when any changes happen to the, data, to the database. The database holds the canonical state of the system um, and that can be updated by either the web app or the capture agent. So if the capture agent, if someone actually presses record on the screen, um, the capture agent tells the database that it's recording and so that gets reflected in the web interface. The same thing happens the other way around. If you press record on the web interface, the web interface updates the database, the capture agent notices it's changed and so um, starts recording. <coughs> so on the capture agent side, uh, again it's real time via DDP. Uh, DDP is a, a very lightweight, simple protocol um, that's defined by the Meteor developers, um, which basically uh, notifies the clients of changes to the um, database state um, by just sending the differences. Um, so it's quite lightweight over the over the wire. It only change only sends the changes from what the client knows about. Um, so currently, there's only a Gallicaster plugin, which is uh, written in Python. Uh, although uh, there are DDP Meteor libraries available for most languages, so um, it shouldn't be too much of an issue to add other capture agents, even if they're not written in Python. Um, so for deployment purposes, uh, it runs oops, that's a, a little bit of a lie. Uh, it requires Node.js and MongoDB, um, doesn't require Nginx, but we uh, run Nginx in front of it to handle HTTPS. Um, and Meteor provides a rather nice command line tool, um, which uh, when you're developing will actually run the application <coughs> along, with the, uh, along with the Mongo. Uh, database for you. You just type Meteor Run and it sets everything up for you. Uh, but to deploy it, you can type Meteor Build and it turns your Meteor app into a um, standard Node app that you can just deploy however you deploy Node apps. Uh, we've also got uh, Docker support um, that we've added. Uh, so <coughs> from a Git checkout, you can just do Docker Compose up um, and have a running system with uh, everything uh, ready for deployment. Um, and then when you change, <coughs> if you change, make any changes to the Peekaboo app itself, then you can just run Docker Compose build Peekaboo um, and it will rebuild the Peekaboo container. <coughs> so um, this is again another little bit of a lie because it's not actually there quite yet, um, but it will be. Um, hopefully tonight if the hotel Wi-Fi is fixed, um, otherwise in the next few days. Uh, it's licensed um, under MIT, so you can pretty much do whatever you like with it. Manchester have always already been playing with it. Keel have started experimenting with it as well, and we've, we've been running it for uh, just over a year, I think, in production. Um, it seems to be uh, useful, and uh, our sport team like it, so that's a good sign. <coughs> so, we've got lots of ideas of how to make it better. Better filtering and stuff, especially when you've got 300 capture agents, you probably need to be able to uh, find the one you're looking for a lot better than we can do at the moment. Um, we'd like to turn the configuration, um, make it web-based rather than at the moment where it's a JSON file, which you have to um, uh, stick in an environment variable when you launch it, so it's not very flexible for reconfiguring at the moment. <coughs> Custom data, like as you saw, our, um, um, we have our link into our network registration system. Um, that part is removed in the uh, open source release because it's very specific to us, but we'd like to add something back in where you can add arbitrary links to other systems. Um, live video to go with the audio would be quite cool. Um, and what uh, somebody was talking about earlier, it was you, wasn't it? Um, with uh, yeah, managing the remote repository um, is probably one of the biggest things that we still have to go into VNC for, uh, is to uh, get Gallicaster to re-ingest something that's uh, broken, so we'd like to add that um, there. And scheduling, which uh, Sussex doesn't do, so um, we haven't 
done anything with the scheduling side of things, but it would probably be a good, a nice idea to um, show at least to show what's upcoming or something. Um, and plugins for other capture agents, which as I say should be relatively straightforward as long as you can run code on the capture agent. Um, it should be relatively straightforward to um, uh, send the information. Um, yeah, pull requests are welcome. We've always had some from uh, Manchester. Um, so I'm sure if you wanted to add something, we'd do it. Um, I just like to say thanks to uh, Cal Shergold, who's um, my boss at the moment, uh, for putting up f with uh, us going off and doing this with weird new technologies that she didn't know about. Um, but um, trusted us to have a go at. Um, everyone in Manchester, especially um, Andy for sending some cool patches. Uh, and you guys for creating Opencast because it's really cool. I like it. And that's about all I've got. <coughs> so, has anyone got any questions? <laughs> So it's not, not a question. I've said this privately, I think, via email. But I just wanted to say a huge thank you to, uh, to Paul, yourself, and other Paul as well, because um, this is a fantastic piece of software. And the fact you open source that is something that we hugely appreciate. And I'm sure Andy would say the same if he was here. I think you know one of the kind of litmus, litmus tests we had for it was whether we could throw in 300 capture agents and then use this user interface on a mobile device from in a theater. And it passes both those tests, which we've never had in any other kind of yeah. you know, uh, capture agent uh, management UI. So yeah, again, you know, thank you for all your work. Yeah, something I should have said is there is a mobile-ish, uh, it's, it's responsive, so it should work reasonably well on a mobile. And I'd like to also add a thank you to Manchester for doing our load testing for us. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks, uh, it looks really nice. Is it, uh, could one put two clients for different services on the same CA? And I'm thinking particularly here, so you've got Galacaster running and also LectureSite running on a capture agent. Could could one create a lecture site client that also gave you similar sets of controls? I don't see why not. Um, the way it works is you specify a, uh, an agent ID uh, in a configuration file on the agent side of things, so there's no reason why you couldn't have two um, agents with different IDs running on the same machine, if that's what you mean. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if it's possible now, but I see you have users. Uh, does it allow filtering based on location for mapping users to uh, handle or manage several uh, devices? Let's say, for instance, you have a manager for a building. He, he manages 10 uh, CAs, and you have a filter it there. Yeah, it's not something that's included at the moment, um, but I think Magister, again, have um, talked about that kind of thing. And um, yeah, that's something we'd like to add. Yeah, so I guess Andy hasn't put it back yet, but he's, he's botched that in. So we have, um, we have a, a local customization for area support group, and that's in, a, in a, the configuration. So um, we've got 130 buildings on campus, and they're divided into like five or six areas, some of them owned by schools, some by faculty, some by central people. And we divvy it up, and there's one of, the, one of the teams that we only let them see their own agents so that they can't manage or control anyone else's. It's, yeah, it should be pretty easy to add in um, because the, the user management stuff is something that um, is provided by the Meteor framework anyway, so it's a matter of setting up groups and, and dealing with it. It's not, not too complicated. 